the way in which underlying convictions control the way you interpret uh, the eyeball facts that you see in your life. Many of you will know this story, but I just remind you of it, of the man who felt that he was dead. He had, he had a strange psychological condition. He, he was convinced that he was a walking dead man. He's going to a psychiatrist, you know, who's trying to work with him and, 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 and lead him out of this conundrum and show him that he's not really a dead man. Finally, the psychiatrist gets very frustrated. He's going to get scientific with the man. And so he says, okay, now listen to me, Bill. Do dead men have blood going through their body? No. So if you cut a dead man, would he bleed? No. So the psychiatrist takes his hand and uses a pin and pricks his finger and blood spurts out. And the psychiatrist says, see Bill, the facts prove it. You're not dead. And the patient looks at that for a minute and he goes, lo and behold, dead men do bleed. <laughs> Yeah, you put a fact out there, the way in which the person's going to jump or respond to the fact depends upon his underlying assumptions. And in this case, the patient, I called Bill, had two convictions. One, that he was dead. Two, that dead men don't bleed. But when presented with counter evidence, you cannot tell from a philosophical standpoint which of those two beliefs he will give up. No one holds a belief in a vacuum, singularly. All of our beliefs are held in tandem, if I can put it that way. There is not a single thing that you believe. If you talk to me later, we'll watch the Olympics and chat about this. You, you present to me something you believe that you could believe all by itself and not believe something else in addition to it. It is impossible to examine beliefs singularly. We may not always put together uh, the beliefs that are being tested by our experiments, but we are always testing groups of beliefs. And in this case, Bill had this grouping of beliefs. At the lowest level, he thought he was dead. At a little higher level, he thought dead men don't bleed. And then when he was shown that he bleeds, he gave up the higher level belief and held on to his deeper conviction that he was dead. It's a very simple procedure. You make a joke out of it, but it's profound for you in defending the faith. You need to understand that unless people change their most fundamental convictions about the nature of reality, how we know what we know, and how we should live our lives, if they don't change their underlying convictions about God and man and the relationship between the two of them, then the facts are going to be dealt with in the same way that the uh, psychiatric patient dealt with the fact of his bleeding. He, they're going to continue to think that there is no God, and now we've got to have these rescuing devices by changing other beliefs. The most important thing that you can do, therefore, in defending your faith and preparing for college as a Christian is to learn to reason as a Christian should reason. It isn't so important that you amass encyclopedias worth of evidence, although all of you should have some. But that isn't the crucial point. The crucial point is to learn how to think as a Christian. Let me uh, illustrate this in my own life. Uh, I hate to do that because I, I'm not looking for any commendation, but there was a point when I decided I wanted to specialize in apologetics, the defense of the Christian faith. And at that time I thought, well, then there's all this stuff out there, especially false religions and cults, that I've got to learn about. And I do think you need to learn about those things. I'm not saying you can go in with zero information. But I mean, there are books and books and books. You would be appalled to know how many variations and different little cults there are and religions. And here I'm thinking, man, how am I going to master all this material? Well, you know, I didn't have to master all that material. I had to master the fundamental issues of religious philosophy. And I hope by God's grace that I've done that or have come close. So now, I don't worry about, I honestly don't, and it's not because I'm arrogant, I don't worry about anybody that I run into at an airport wants to talk about religion. I don't care what kind of, you know, uh, subdivision of a subdivision of whatever bizarre little narrow cult out there that he belongs to, it makes no difference. The questions are the same, and the problems with non-Christian answers are the same. And so, 
obviously it saves me a lot of time to get down to the basics, doesn't it? That way I don't have to master all the high-level details of what everybody believes out there because I can talk to just about anybody and if I know the right questions and I know what to push on, then I can talk to anybody. This is a variation of the, the method of defending the faith known as letting the unbeliever give enough rope to hang him with. If you know how to query, if you know how to, you have to be careful how you say that, if you know how to ask the right questions, and you know what issues to push on, then you'll be able to deal with any worldview, any underlying philosophy that comes along. And so in the development of a Christian worldview, let me try to give you some, um, some keys about uh, doing that. If you want to develop a Christian worldview, here are some, some pointers. First of all, you need to be self-conscious about your own presuppositions. Self-conscious about your own presuppositions. Proverbs 1.7, the writer of Proverbs tells us that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. You need to be aware that as a Christian you have a distinctive approach to how people should reason, how they should draw their conclusions. You should know something about the underlying theological convictions that make you a Christian. What do you believe about God, the creation of the world, the relationship of God to the world, how he saves men, how we know what we know about God and how he calls upon us to live. You need to be very self-conscious about that. It will do no good to have some kind of general label, I'm a Christian. You must now know what the substance of that is. What is essential to being a Christian? What is crucial? What does the Bible say about these things? you need to re realize that neutrality is not a possibility for you. It is impossible for you to set aside your Christian convictions and enter into a discussion with somebody, professor, roommate, whatever it may be, and say, okay, let's all be neutral about this. Let's all pretend we don't have any presuppositions. I guarantee you, you will be pretending you don't have presuppositions. But since we've all decided to play this game, like go bump in the dark, let's, let's put on the blindfolds and pretend we don't have presupposition and then see what happens when we try to dance, you know? You can't carry on a conversation pretending that something isn't so when it is and then be able to predict where it's going to go. And here's the worst part of it. When you pretend you don't have presuppositions and let the unbeliever pretend you don't have presuppositions, since no one can get away with that, you're really going to have presuppositions, guess whose presuppositions you're going to be using? The unbeliever's. The unbeliever's not going to accidentally say, well, I guess I've been assuming all along that Christianity is true and the Bible's right. That isn't going to happen. So when the unbeliever says, let's just lay aside our, our convictions and our distinctives and everybody try to be neutral, whether the unbeliever realizes it or not, he or she is inviting you to just lay aside your Christian presuppositions. Let's just all be very secular about this, you know? So you must first of all become self-conscious about what your presuppositions are and realize that being neutral is an impossibility for everybody, including yourself. In John the 17th chapter, verse 17, Jesus prayed to our Heavenly Father that we would be set apart by the truth, and then he declared, thy word is true. Jesus wants his people to be a distinctive people, set apart, unique, consecrated. And he wants us to be consecrated specifically by the truth. What makes us different is that the truth has set us free and has made us a different people. And then Jesus adds, thy word is truth. What makes Christians different when they reason with unbelievers, when they go into the science lab, when they do literature or translation or if they play basketball, what makes Christians different is everything they think and do is, gu is guided by the word of God. The fear of the Lord is the beginning point of wisdom the beginning point of knowledge. We have the idea that what we should really do is lay aside all of our philosophical convictions, all of our presuppositions, then we'll go in there and we'll fight the battle over the facts, and at the end of the reasoning process, at the end, then we'll bow the knee to God and honor his authority and his sovereign prerogatives. At the end of the process, then we're going to say, yes, there is a God, the Bible is true, I must become a Christian. At the end of the process. 
And yet the Proverbs tells you what? The beginning of knowledge is the fear of the Lord. That doesn't come after you've figured everything out and you've proven to your own satisfaction that the Bible is true. That's the starting point of knowledge. You say, well, but there are a lot of people, Dr. Bonson, who don't start with that point. Yes, and the Proverbs deals with that too. It goes on to say, and fools despise wisdom and instruction. If you will not begin with God as your presupposition, the living and true God, the God who reveals himself in the scripture, if you do not make that your beginning point, then the Bible says you end up being a fool and you despise wisdom and instruction. If we could encapsulate what I want to teach you this week, it's right there. I want you to see that if you start out with the Christian worldview, bowing the knee and your heart, giving your life, to the Lord. If you begin with Christian presuppositions and perspective, you can make sense out of this world and its glorious place, a great place to live in. God's been very good to us. But if you do not start with that, you cannot make sense out of anything. You will end up despising wisdom and instruction. And like the instructor who says there is no truth, what you'll do is you'll just give up the game, really. Nobody can know for sure. Proverbs has it right. Your beginning point is going to determine where you come out at the end. And so make the right choices. Make sure your philosophical foundations are secure. Be self-conscious about your presuppositions. That's my first piece of advice. Secondly, make sure that what you think as a Christian is governed and corrected by the Word of God and not by worldly traditions. Make sure that you are governed and corrected by the Word of God and not worldly traditions. In Colossians 2, verses 3 to 8, the Apostle Paul teaches this very thing. If you have your Bibles, it would be good to look at this, I think. Colossians 2, beginning at the third verse. Paul says about Jesus Christ, "...in whom are all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge deposited. This I say that no one may delude you with persuasiveness of speech, for though I am absent in the flesh, yet am I with you in spirit, joying and beholding your order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. As therefore you receive Christ Jesus, the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and builded up in him, and established in your faith, even as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. And take heed, lest anyone rob you through his philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the elementary principles of the world, and not after Christ. Paul begins in verse 3 by telling us what we saw in Proverbs 1-7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Paul puts it this way, all the treasures of wisdom and instruction, all that man can know is deposited in Christ. If one does not begin with Jesus Christ and the revelation of Christ, one destroys the possibility of knowing anything. And therefore, when you know unbelievers that have caught on to some truths, and I don't deny that many unbelievers are very smart people, they often know very much more than we do even. The man who did open heart surgery on me, who is an unbeliever, knows a whole lot more about human anatomy and the functioning of the human heart than I do. I don't doubt that for a minute. But what he knows, and what every unbeliever that you come in contact with knows, is a treasure that Jesus Christ makes possible. And when we do not honor the one in whom all these truths are deposited, when we do not see that you have to understand the revelation of Christ to make sense out of what you know, then we're really guilty of robbing from the Lord. And I'm glad my heart surgeon saved my life. I wish I could save his by telling him that you could only know these things by first understanding who Christ is and what Christ has revealed about himself and about you and the nature of this world. In Christ are deposited all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And Paul says, this is why I'm telling you this. This I say in order that no one may delude you with persuasiveness of speech. I don't want people to come along and bamboozle you, Paul says. I want you to be aware of the fact that if you're not conscious that every truth depends upon Christ, or what we'll call the Christian worldview, that which Christ reveals to us about himself and us in the world, if you don't know that, then people are going to come along with persuasive speech and easily draw you aside. You need to be aware 
that everything your professor knows, he may be so smart when it comes to geometry or geology or when it comes to basketball, he may know so much, but he doesn't know anything that he can give an account of if he doesn't have Jesus Christ as part of his thinking. Paul says, I want you to know that so that you won't be deluded with persuasive speech. Now, we should look at the rest of the passage, but I don't want to run out of time again, so I'll jump down to verse 8. Paul says, take heed, beware, be on the lookout, lest anyone would rob you, literally mug you. Someone come along and take advantage of you and steal your money. Beware lest anyone make spoil of you through his philosophy and vain deceit, which is after the tradition of men, after the elementary principles of the world, and not after Christ. Um, I've occasionally in my life had people tell me that this verse indicates that I was in sin for studying philosophy. Um, and they were well-meaning. I think they were very wrong, but very well-meaning because they thought this verse said it's wrong for you to pay attention to philosophy. You look at the verse in your own Bible. Is that what Paul says? Paul said, don't study philosophy. Don't even think about it. Get it out of your head. What a horrible thought. No, he doesn't. What he says is, beware of philosophy. Okay? Beware of it. And secondly, he doesn't say beware of all philosophy. He says beware of a particular kind of philosophy. Philosophy that he calls vain deceit after the traditions of men and after the elementary principles of the world. Um, of course, I don't know what translations you will have in your hands there. Uh, my translation actually says rudiments of the world. Um, others uh, use different ways of putting it, but I think elementary principles is the best translation. The Greek word is stoicheia. It's found elsewhere in the New Testament, for instance, in the book of Hebrews, for that which amounts to the building blocks of learning, the stoicheia, the basic principles by which you learn. And here Paul says, be careful that you don't have a philosophy that is vain deceit after the tradition of men and after the building blocks of learning of the world, the elements or the stoicheia of the world. Be on the watch out, not for, watch out, not for all philosophy, but for a particular kind of philosophy, a philosophy that is vain deception. And it's vain deception because it does not learn first of all from the revelation of God and then see all of the world in light of that. It's a philosophy that's after the traditions of men. It's very hard for uh, Christians to go into the study of philosophy and other fields as well, but it's very hard for them to go into philosophy and not be pulled over easily into thinking, well, what we have to do is follow one of these traditions of men. The pressure is great there. You'll be told, you can't bring your Christianity into philosophy. That's not fair. That's the religion department. Paul says, watch out. Don't let those persuasive words delude you. Don't be robbed of the knowledge you can have Notice the connection between verse 8 and verse 3. Verse 3 says, all the treasures are yours in Christ. Verse 8 says, don't be robbed of them. What are the treasures you might be robbed of? The treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Be careful. You are able to know things based on the revelation of Jesus Christ, but if you are persuaded by human words and go after human traditions and follow the elementary principles of learning of the world, you'll be robbed. Okay, so Paul does not say, don't do philosophy. He says, be careful of it. And he doesn't say all philosophy is bad. He says, be careful of a particular kind. But notice the very last part of the passage. He says that we should take heed, lest anyone make spoil of us through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men and the elementary principles of the world, and not after Christ. See, Paul's not against philosophy. He believes there is a philosophy which is after Christ, and you have to be careful that you don't go after one of the other ones. He says you have to be real careful that your philosophy is after or according to Christ, in whom all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are deposited. It's very important, then, as you develop your Christian worldview, that you are first self-conscious about what you believe. Be aware of what your presuppositions are. Secondly, make sure that your presuppositions are governed by and corrected by the Word of God, not worldly traditions, not what men have to say. And that means you have to become a better student of the Bible than most of you are. And I don't want you to think I say that as a gratuitous insult. 
I don't. Um, many of you I already know, and I have a great fondness and affection and respect for you. Those that I don't know, I'm, I'm proud of you for being at a camp like this and being willing to study this material. So I think well of you. But I know what it is to be a teenager, too, and to be a college student, to be pressed. And I have to tell you that if there was something that I'd go back and change, there are many, actually, but if there was one thing on the top of the list that I'd go back and change, it is I'd give a whole lot more time to studying the Bible than I thought was necessary when I was in college. And I studied it a lot. And I'm convinced now I should have studied it ten times more. Make sure you are grounded in the Word of God. If it's a choice between studying for your chemistry test and doing your personal devotions, study for the chemistry test and repent of your sins, and then twice as much devotions after the test is over. I got you, didn't I? You thought I was going to go on and say something else. I understand the pressure that we put ourselves into by our compromises and our sinfulness and our laziness and our irresponsibility. But I want you to know that if you do not pay attention to the Word of God, you will not self-consciously develop a Christian outlook. Thirdly, you need to recognize the ultimate authority of God in everything that you believe and do. The ultimate authority of God. That seems like an obvious point, but very few Christians have thought it through. The ultimate authority of God is well expressed by the Apostle Paul in Romans 3, verse 4. I don't hear any pages turning out there. Romans 3, verse 4. <clears throat> Paul has proposed a certain thought, and he says, God forbid, ye let God be found true, but every man a liar. And he goes on to quote the scripture. God forbid, yea, let God be found true, though every man a liar. Is that really your perspective? Are you prepared, heart and soul, to go along with what Paul says there? Because you know what he's saying? If the whole world were to be in agreement against what God says in his word, he says, let God be true. And you need to be prepared to say of the entire world, even your mother and your father, your boyfriend, your girlfriend, you need to be prepared to say of all the professors at your university, no matter how prestigious the school, you are lying if you disagree with what God says. See, so that's where Paul's coming from. Ultimate authority. Nothing takes precedence over the Word of God. Nothing. That doesn't mean it's wrong for you to reconsider your interpretation of the Word of God. Don't get me wrong. As Christians, we grow in our understanding. We find out we didn't quite have it right previously. We should continue to grow in our apprehension of what the Bible teaches. But it must be your theoretical commitment that if the Bible teaches something, and to the degree that you believe the Bible teaches something, you cannot let anything get in the way of that commitment. You might have something that forces you to go back and say, did I interpret it right? But you can't have something, because there are so many people out there who disagree with you, that tells you, well, then I guess the Bible must be wrong. Let God be true, though all men are liars, he says. The vast majority of people take the Gallup poll approach to truth. They may not self-consciously or explicitly tell you that that's what they're doing, but they do. It's incredible, the mentality. It's, although the truth, once we count the noses. How many people say this? How many people say that? Well, the majority is always right. Right? Epistemological democracy. What? <laughs> Get that bogus sign out. What does he mean by epistemological? Epistemology deals with the theory of knowledge. And we'll say more about it when we get into philosophy here. The theory of knowledge. With respect to a theory of knowledge, there are some people who want to be Democrats. They want to say, well, the majority you know, gets their way. Well, I'm not against the social theory of democracy. I mean, in a society where people disagree, the majority must govern. That's fine. Must determine who rules us and so forth. But when it comes to matters of truth, it makes no difference at all what the majority say. Paul says you could have the entire world. You could have 100% of the people in the world say something contrary to God. And Paul says, let God be true, though every man is a liar. So the ultimate authority of God is something you must be very self-conscious about if you're going to develop a Christian worldview. You mustn't let contrary voices get in the way, or the Gallup poll mentality, this epistemological democracy. 
But there are other things you mustn't let get in the way either. And this is going to sound kind of funny, but hear me out. You mustn't let the facts get in the way either. It was once said of, um, of Hegel, who had developed, uh, Hegel was a German philosopher of the 19th century, who had uh, perhaps the last grand metaphysical scheme, you know, for understanding world history and the nature of reality and so forth. And uh, it would take me the rest of my time to tell you everything about that particular scheme. But the point is, it, it had to have a place for everything. Everything fit into Hegel's uh, view of the dialectic of history, one way or another. Well, I don't know if the story is true, but it goes like this. A student once approached Hegel and said, um, but Dr. Hegel, the facts don't fit your theory, and then gave some illustrations, to which it is said that Hegel responded, then the facts be hung. Now, that's not what I'm saying. I told you that story so you'd see what I'm not telling you. I'm not saying, well, then the facts be hung. It's kind of like we're going to close our eyes to anything. But I want you to understand that what you, under what you see to be a fact and how you interpret a fact will be governed by your presuppositions. We have some nice illustrations of that in the New Testament. 2 Peter 1, verses 16 and 19 is where we'll begin. 2 Peter 1, verses 16 and 19. Peter says, For we did not follow cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Now at this point, Peter is saying, we saw Jesus, and we saw his glory. Particularly, I think Peter is thinking of his experience on the Mount of Transfiguration. Peter says, we didn't make this stuff up. We're not liars, we're not storytellers, we didn't follow fables. We told you what we saw as eyewitnesses of his majesty and glory. And yet look at what Peter says in verse 19. And we have the word of prophecy more sure, whereunto you do well that you take heed as unto a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. Peter says, I was an eyewitness of the majesty of Christ. And then he goes on to say, but we have the word of prophecy more sure. More sure than what? More sure even than my eyeball experience. There's a man who was there. I mean, he could appear on the eyewitness news of the ancient world and tell about Jesus and what he saw. And yet he says to us, the word of prophecy is more sure even than my eyeball experience. Think about Abraham, who's the father of the faithful. We're all told we're to walk in the steps of our father Abraham. Paul tells us that, for instance. He's the father of those who have faith. What kind of faith did Abraham have? According to Romans, the fourth chapter. Turn in your Bibles to Romans 4. And I'll begin at verse 17. As it is written, the father of many nations have I made thee, before him whom he believed, even God, who gives life to the dead, and calls the things that are not as though they were, who in hope believed against hope, to the end that he might become a father of many nations, according to that which had been spoken, so shall thy seed be. <clears throat> Let me fill you in quickly here. In the Old Testament, God appeared to Abraham when he was an old man when his wife was an old woman, and on top of it, his wife was barren. And God appeared to Abraham at that time, that season in his life, and said, Abraham, I'm going to make you the father of many nations. In fact, you're going to have so many children, ultimately, it'd be like the sand of the sea and the stars of the sky. I don't know how Abraham held it in. I don't know how he didn't just say, yeah, right. Consider the facts here, God. <laughs> He didn't. Sarah had a harder time. Apparently she was overhearing this in the kitchen and she laughed. For which the son of promise is now known throughout history as laughter. That's what Isaac means in Hebrew. It's ak, to laugh. But Abraham did not challenge God. He believed him. And what Paul says is, he in hope believed against hope. What a great expression. He in hope believed against hope. What does that mean? All human expectation, all the hope that Abraham would have gotten if he would have been to the fertility experts of his day, 
would have been against this. Can you imagine Abraham going to the doctors, you know, one after another, getting second, third, fourth opinions, saying, do you think I can have a baby with my wife? And the doctors would say, come on, Abraham, no way. You're not going to have a baby. And even if you could, she can't. And so it was against all human hope that Abraham, in hope, believed. And listen to how Paul puts it. Who in hope believed against hope that he might become a father of many nations, according to that which had been spoken, so shall thy seed be. Abraham listened to the word of God against all hope that the empirical experts could have given him in that day, against all human expectation. When God said it, he said he could do it. God can, because he's sovereign. Nothing's too hard for God. And he did that. I have to tell you a little bit more about Abraham, though, because the story's too good to miss. You know that Abraham, though he was a man of faith, he did blow it. At first he thought, okay, God has told me this is the way it's going to be, and he's left it to me to figure out how it's going to happen. And so he took Hagar, the handmaiden of his wife, and had a son through her, to which, to Abraham's you know, chagrin, God said, Abraham, you have it wrong. I meant Sarah. And so the hostility between the Jews and the Arabs stems from that very mistake of Abraham. And uh, Hagar and uh, her son, Ishmael, are cast out. It's another story. Abraham goes on, and finally Sarah does have a son named Isaac, remembering the laughter of the mother that God would do such a thing to her in her old age, in her barrenness. And then later, after Isaac had grown to be a young man, God appeared to Abraham and said, Abraham, I have something I want you to do. I want you to prepare for a sacrifice. Have Isaac help you. And he went out to a mountain far away from where he lived <clears throat> and prepared the sacrifice and was willing to make the sacrifice and to light it and so forth. But you know who he was to sacrifice or what he was to sacrifice? His own son. I want you to think about that. Abraham believed against all hope, according to the word of God, that he'd be given a son of promise. And he finally got that son, through whom he would have grandchildren and more grandchildren, great-grandchildren, and finally he'd be the father of many nations. Everything rested upon that boy. And God said, sacrifice him. The Bible commends the faith of Abraham at that point in his life as well in the book of Hebrews. The book of Hebrews says that Abraham was willing to sacrifice his own son. The only way, humanly, you could see that God would now bring this about. He was willing to sacrifice his own son. And Hebrews says, believing that God could raise the dead. Abraham was not a New Testament Christian, you know. He didn't know about Lazarus being raised from the dead and Jesus rise from the dead and so forth. Abraham, thousands of years earlier, was willing to sacrifice the only son he had, given to him miraculously by God, because he said, if so be, God will raise the dead to fulfill his promise. Now that's faith. It's not a faith that ignores the facts. It's a faith that governs our understanding of the facts. Then one more illustration I want you to look at. Luke 16, verse 31. I was talking to one of you for a bit at the break about this. It's the story of the rich man and Lazarus as told by Jesus. The rich man who lived a life of uh, self-indulgence when he died went to Hades and there was in great torment. And somebody that he had ignored all through his life, a poor man at his gate, who was so bad off that the dogs licked his wounds, that poor man, Lazarus, died on the very same day and he went to Abraham's bosom, which is a Jewish idiom for heaven. He went to the glory and the bliss of heaven, and the rich man went to hell. And Jesus tells the story of the rich man in hell, in his torment, seeing Lazarus, knowing what he could have had, and he cries out that um, it would be possible that he would go back and warn his brothers on earth of this terrible place, hell. 
And Jesus puts into the mouth of Abraham here, Jesus' own words actually answering this point of view, Jesus has Abraham say, No, they have Moses and the prophets. If they hear not them, neither will they believe the one rise from the dead. Wait a minute, Jesus. If they had the facts, if they had a miraculous fact, if they had the resurrection facts in front of them, they wouldn't believe, Jesus says, no. Because it begins by hearing Moses and the prophets. It begins by submitting to the word of God. And in terms of your submission to the word of God, then the miracles make sense. And then they can be accepted and they'll be interpreted properly. But if they will not hear Moses and the prophets, all the rest will make no difference. Now, do you think Jesus was exaggerating? Do you think he was overdoing it here? What happened when Jesus rose from the dead? That he might warn people not to go to hell. The Jews paid the soldiers to lie about it. Isn't that amazing? Jesus knew exactly what he was talking about. The facts don't determine what people will believe. It's their underlying worldview. It's their original religious convictions that make all the difference. So as you develop a Christian worldview, one, you must be self-conscious about what your presuppositions are. Two, you must be governed and corrected by the Word of God and not by human traditions. Three, you must honor the ultimate authority of God. Let God be true, though all men are liars. You must honor the Word of God even when the apparent facts are against it. You must recognize that the word of prophecy is more sure than even your eyeball experience. That's how high the authority of God's word is for you. And fourthly, you must understand that in a Christian worldview, God's word applies to every area of life. Every area of life. You cannot have this idea that Christianity or the word of God is for some narrow domain, some slice of life. It is for everything you do, everything that you think, everything that you say. 2 Corinthians 10, verse 5, tells us how we are going to be effective defenders of the faith. First Corinthians, excuse me, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5. The Apostle Paul says, Actually, let me give you verse 4 as some background. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but mighty before God for the casting down of strongholds. Paul says we don't use physical weapons. we got something much better. Now, you're going to be tempted. I, I dare say, you'll be tempted to want to use physical weapons sometimes. And when I say, I'm just going to get a gun and shoot this guy. I'm tired of hearing this argument. Okay? Maybe we could beat some sense into this guy, but Paul says, no, the weapons of our warfare are not fleshly. They are not physical weapons. And because of that, they're mighty before God for casting down strongholds. And he says in verse 5, casting down reasonings, that's the Greek, reasonings, and every high thing exalted against the knowledge of God. And how are we going to take any reasoning any high thing exalted against the knowledge of God, how are we going to tear it down? He says, by bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. To develop an effective Christian worldview that can refute all comers, you must learn to bring every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Every thought. Not just what you believe about heaven and hell, your sin and salvation. Not just what you believe about God being the Creator. Not just what you think about prayer and evangelism. You must bring every thought captive to the obedience of Christ in your history classes and in your literature classes and out on the basketball court. You must do it in the science lab. You must do it in the voting booth. You must do it when it comes to the spending of your money. Everything that you think must be governed by the Word of God. Now, you already knew that because I told you early on Proverbs 1.7 says that the beginning of knowledge is the fear of the Lord. Not the end of knowledge, not after you've done all your reasoning, but at the very outset. You must bring every thought, therefore, captive to the obedience of Christ, or you're going to be robbed of the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. You're going to be left with a worldview that's indefensible. Now, if every thought is to be brought captive to the obedience of Christ, then think about this. The effectiveness of your apologetic will be measured by your ability to see Christ in everything that you do and say. That's what you need to be working toward, and uh, to a certain degree, we'll help you this week, hopefully, in camp to do it. 
when we come back together, we're going to talk about what philosophy is and what kinds of philosophies there are out there so you know what the opposition looks like. And I'll try to give you some strategies for dealing with them.